It's now my privilege to call to the stage one of my favorite Manhattan Institute senior fellows, Mark Mills, who will introduce our next speaker. One of your favorite? <laughs> I'm just going to leave now, Molly. I'm sorry. I have the, uh, the pleasure and honor of uh, introducing you all to someone who I am honored to be able to call a friend and colleague. Um, before I do that, I want to just make a, a quick observation because uh, that's the privilege and, and, uh, that I get as the introducer. Before I tell you, uh, just a skosh about uh, Tom Fanning. First, I want to give you a piece of advice because you've heard some good advice. This is a, a conference about the future. So I want to give you a piece of advice. Uh, you know Peter Drucker, the great management consultant, who one of his aphorisms, he had many. One of, one of the two or three that I found is my favorite is he said, the future is what you create. Right? I mean, there's a lot of pessimism in the world today. You, you all, you know this, you've been told this are the future. So I want, to, I want to give you the context of a piece of advice about the future that you will create. In this way, you know, you remember the movie? You know the movie. It was, it's famous, The Godfather, right? Everybody knows the movie, The Godfather. You know how this organization began. This organization began, you have in your midst today, the godmother, Marilyn Fedock, right? So the, <clears throat> there's the relationship between this. So my advice to you is don't screw up because the godmother is watching you, right? We, we're, we, you know, we older guys and gals are handing you off a pretty good deck of cards. You think the world's in terrible shape. You know, you have to build stuff. You've got a big career ahead of you. So just let me remind you, when I began, roughly began my career, roughly contemporaneous with your age, the world was in pretty bad shape. Islamic terrorists had just taken over a country in Iran, right? Remember the Iranian revolution? It was pretty ugly. We had our embassy sacked. Inflation was in double-digit percentages. The housing market was a disaster compared to today. Unemployment was at higher levels than it is today. If you had a degree, you weren't getting a job. People in England I knew were coming out of Oxford to work at Harrods selling shoes. Now, the world was a real mess, 1980. We did okay, you know? It was a pretty good run of growth the last 35 years. You, you guys, have been, you're handed a good deck of cards, so don't screw it up. I know you can, you're at the most exciting time, in my opinion, in, opinion in the world, and you, you are, you are inheriting an opportunity that's tremendous. You can build a lot with it. Which will bring me to a great leader like Tom Fanning, who works in the electric utility industry, which some of you may think is old school. It's not old school. It's at the epicenter of some great tumult in business and business management. So let me tell you a couple things about the electric industry, which are kind of interesting coincidences. Uh, one is a word coincidence. The company that uh, Tom Fanning is uh, president, CEO, and chairman of uh, began uh, with a gentleman whose name was James Mitchell. Mitchell. It's kind of interesting because that company, amongst a hand few, hand few then, created a revolution in America. It was a revolutionary energy industry. Another Mitchell started another revolution, George Mitchell. You know, not too long ago, you know who George Mitchell is. Mitchell Energy started the uh, fracking revolution in Texas. I think it's kind of interesting, the two, two Mitchells. The first Mitchell was Canadian, by the way, which is kind of interesting. I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm Canadian, so I was proud of the fact that my friend's company was uh, inspired by a Canadian. So it's, it was sort of a, a nice connectivity. The other coincidence, which is a business and policy coincidence, which I think Tom will talk to you a little bit about, is a timing coincidence. So Con Ed was one of the earliest utilities as well. It, was, it, it really traces its birth to roughly 1900 here in New York City. It only took 35 years from the birth of a great industry to a point in time in which the government decided that it was an industry that was so important the government had to have control over it, called the Public Utilities Holding Company Act of 1935, which regulated the electricity business as a utility. 35 years after its essential flowering and birth. Isn't it an interesting coincidence if we trace the birth of the internet era to roughly 1980 when Apple went public to today, 35 years ago, the government in its wisdom has decided that the internet is a utility. 
which the bureaucrats in Washington are smarter about running, operating, and regulating than anybody in any of those businesses out there. I don't think that uh, Silicon Valley has woken up yet to realize what it's like to work in an industry like that. Tom Fanning knows what it's like to work in an industry like that. And he's an interesting CEO. So let me just tell you by way of introduction what a, a last aphorism that relates to Tom Fanning. I've had the pleasure of watching him operate uh, in public forums but also behind closed doors with his executive team. So winding back to what Andy told you, what I've observed in meeting with and working with hundreds of CEOs is that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between a company's success, I find. Almost always there are exceptions and the CEO's not just skill set but his demeanor, his manner, how he treats his people. Uh, Tom Fanning is an interesting guy because what he does is what Drucker talked about when he talked about management. Drucker launched management consulting in an era where people believed that organizing businesses was like organizing cogs in a machine. It was the, the, the era of mass production and the Ford automotive. Everybody thought that the, the workers were like cogs in a machine. Drucker thought otherwise. He thought people were human. They needed to be treated with dignity and respect. That was his whole life. Tom Fanning, uh, in my opinion, if you watch him operate with his people, not only lives and breathes, that's how he operates. It's interesting to watch him operate and watch his people. And it's how I see you taking the future, is emulating great leaders of integrity and character like a gentleman like Tom Fanning. Tom? Well, that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, Mills is one of my inspirations in this business. He's a terrific guy, and he and I have collaborated a lot. I really respect that. Thank you for that. Uh, I wouldn't plan on doing this. I actually don't do speeches. I have conversations with my closest friends, right? So what we're going to do is just have a conversation here. I've got to reflect on a couple of things that have already been said. Number one, uh, you were talking about the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935. Fascinating stuff. But did you know the game of Monopoly, that was built around the breakup of the robber baron era and breaking up big business, the game of Monopoly was created right about that time. You know the guy with the top hat and the goofy mustache of Monopoly? You know what I'm talking about? Samuel Insull. He created modern electric networks across kind of the Midwest and into the Northeast. He was a utility guy. The last company that was sold out of the, in fact, wait a minute, I got to tell you, Aunt Samuel Insull actually got thrown into jail for securities fraud. Go to jail. He was exonerated while he was in jail. Get out of jail free. Ultimately, true story, ultimately died penniless. The last Insull company that was sold was bought by Southern Company. It was Georgia Power and Light. Uh, second thing that somebody said, Godfather. I love that. I actually use the Godfather in some of my stuff at, at Southern Company. But I do it when I talk to a group where I don't want anybody to, you know, release a secret. We're talking in confidence here among friends. And I always use the story about uh, uh, Mo Green. Mo, Mo Green and the Godfather, have you all seen that? Mo Green was the guy the Godfather said to run Las Vegas. And there's a great scene in the movie where the Godfather's blowing away everybody at the end of the movie, right? And Mo Green's the guy sitting on a table getting a massage. You know, towels are in all the right places. I think it's a PG or R, light R. And uh, the door comes bursting open, guy comes in, Mo Green puts his glasses on, guy shoots him right through the eye. Blood comes spurting out, it's a great scene. <laughs> and, the, and the story there was, if you violate a confidence, you're dead. Got it? So normally I say that, I don't have any, to, any confidence to share here, but these are management principles you should know. The, uh, the last movie I just want to hit is kind of what I'm doing right now, and that is The Matrix. Uh, you know in The Matrix where they download into the star guy, you know, how to do judo and whatever it is, his eyes go all crazy and they just load it in in a hurry. That's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to move through this thing in a hurry, so if you start goofing out, it's okay. Um, there are three kind of companies in the world today, and they are known as birds of prey, moving prey, and roadkill. Now, where you fit in that spectrum depends upon your ability to succeed in the long and short run. Birds of prey are companies like Southern Company, I believe, that are structured to first provide for long-term success, however you define that, and we make the short run success work. Moving prey, of course, are the people you see all the time that optimize short-term success at the expense of and sometimes imperiling their long-term success. And then, of course, roadkill are the guys that can't get out of bed in the morning and you see them all the time anyway. 
But the question, I think, is not so much, are you a bird of prey or a moving prey? Do you really preserve your long-term and short-term success profiles? Is really, how do you define it? When Anthony was up here, you know, success isn't about you. And it's not about Southern Company. It's about them. It's about the people we serve. And when I talk about responsibility, it's not about me, it's not about my teammates, it's about the institutions. So it may be Southern Company, it may be the industry, it may be the American economy. And I take it as my role and an and obligation, not an option, to impact that in a very positive way. Now, what's fascinating is whenever I think about kind of success and about them, it's always helpful to put a face on who you serve. So we serve four and a half million people in the Southeast, four and a half million customers anyway. But here's something that I think you're going to talk about later in the program, and that is income inequality in America. See, we have this enormous obligation. When I think about kind of, if I was defining it by what I do, what Southern Company does, it's make, move, and sell electricity. When I think about what I owe them, it is that my customers deserve, and I am accountable for, delivering clean, safe, reliable, and affordable energy to make their lives better. Now, I want you to recognize something. We serve Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Panhandle of Florida. We have competitive generation all across the southern United States, all the way from California back over here to Carolina, all over the place. All right? We're one of the largest electricity companies in the world. 40% no, 46% of the families that we are privileged to serve make less than $40,000 a year. And what do they want? What they want for their children, because I don't think it's really about yourself, it's about your family and everybody you serve, yourself, is a better place to live, better food on the table, better medical care, better education. And those families make tough kitchen table economic decisions every day. And as business leaders, as you start to migrate into that kind of role in society, why can't we? When I think about all the challenges facing the world and the unrest in the Ukraine and in the Middle East, and kind of this worry about growth in Asia, when I think about the challenges we have here in the United States, not to mention a frozen Congress and government, who's going to step into the breach? See, I think it's us. I think business now can play a really important role in helping to solve the problems of America. These immense challenges. I think people are thirsting for a way to play offense. In every strategy, and people say, oh, I want to do strategy. You better understand that with every strategy, there's defense and offense. So often in America today, we get caught up in defense. It's all about ourselves and preserving my position. What we've got to do is find a way to play offense in everything we do. And sports fans, I am delighted to tell you that for the challenges we see in America today, there are so many people trying to dumb down American aspirations, trying to settle with a new normal. That is complete and utter garbage. We have unacceptably high unemployment, too slow economic growth. What are we going to do about it? How do we play defense? Americans want that answer. It's business people that can provide it through technology change. I'm proud to say that the energy complex in America is one way that we can get that done. Unlike any time in my parents' lifetime, my lifetime, your lifetime, America is in a position where we can be energy secure. Now, that doesn't mean independent. But what it does mean is we could be a net exporter and by 2030, 35, be a net exporter, say by 2020, 2030, 2035, we can be the biggest energy producer on the globe. That's enormous. It's a complete game changer. For so long, we have energy policy today and therefore a lot of economic policy set on a kind of premise of scarcity. We've got to turn that on its head and think about policy set on abundance, not scarcity. And in the process, I think we do the right things, and so we work relentlessly in Washington, and in any form that we can develop to preach these truths 
that we can create probably by 2020 another 2 million jobs just related to industry, I mean, uh, the energy industry, and by 2035 another 5 million jobs. And when I think about the ethics of business, what is more ethical than providing for someone a job, more pay, the opportunity to make themselves better, right? It isn't about giving people fish, teaching them to fish. As leaders of the enterprise, as leaders of an industry, we have the ability to play offense like nowhere else before. And so it's so exciting right now to create in this context of an American and international economy a way for America to have a position that could be unassailable in its advantages for decades to come. Now I'm going to translate that quickly to electricity. I could go on on a lot of different fronts here. But electricity, it means three things to me. Number one, I used to run around, and you could look at my stuff on YouTube and, and on the web and all that, and we publish stuff all the time, but uh, I used to say all the arrows in the quiver, President Obama came out and said all the above, so what the heck, all the above. But whatever you call it, it's the full portfolio. Southern Company today is the only company in America doing all the above. We're building a new nuclear plant in Georgia. We're building a coal plant in Mississippi that is cleaner than carbon footprint than natural gas. Carbon capture. And the carbon isn't a waste stream. We use it to produce more domestic oil through enhanced oil recovery. And we're producing tax base and jobs and better lives for thousands of people. We've made a big move away from coal to natural gas. We're one of the leaders in the United States in renewables, especially in photovoltaic solar. And we're also doing energy efficiency in a big way. So the first issue on electricity is promote the full portfolio. Don't let yourself get, get uh, caught up in kind of one angle or another. Everything must work. Second, energy innovation. We've got to have this kind of moonshot-like fervor. When I think about the innovation in technology, I used to be CIO. It was one of my, I had 15 jobs in my 33 years at Southern. One of them was CIO. Most days I thought that meant career is over. <laughs> but I got to tell you, when I think about how much value has been created in the IT space in America, and think about the ramifications of this new regime that Mark just suggested to you, Holy smokes, but why don't we do, and then this Mitchell guy, huh, he did fracking. That's technology revolution in the energy space. We are engaged in that right now. What does the future hold? One of the things that I fight with my team about is we've been so successful for so long, the highest bond ratings, the highest level of TSR, you know, great stuff, highest level of customer satisfaction. The top four companies in America last year in satisfying customers were ours. Okay? And they say, change? What are you talking about? Look how good I am. This notion of creative destruction, of inventing the future, of creating optionality in an uncertain world. You guys know of anybody in finance here, that especially during times of volatility, every option has value, and option value grows during periods of high volatility. That's where we are. So, innovation is a big deal. Proud to say Southern Company is the only company in America today that does proprietary, robust research and development. Number three, restore America's financial integrity. Sounds a little highfalutin, but we are the people to step into the breach. Three pieces to that one. Number one, we've got to unfreeze Congress. Find ways to get bipartisan support and get Congress back in the role of setting policy. They are the only people in my business with the lens to balance clean, safe, reliable, affordable. Regulators do not get Congress back in the game. Number two, fix the balance sheet. America is a wonderful place and makes wonderful promises to its citizens. Can we afford them? I know this gets translated into this argument about should government be bigger or smaller? Should we spend more or less? I tend to believe less. But in any event, think about policy not through that argument, but through what can we do to promote growth and grow jobs and grow personal incomes and make American lives better. We've got to restructure the balance sheet, provide for growth. Third area, I could spend a lot of time, I'll shoot this one quickly, comprehensive tax reform. We have the goofiest tax structure in the history of the planet right now, and we need to wipe it out. 
Uh, we worked with Simpson Bowles. I worked with uh, uh, Bacchus Camp on ideas to completely whiteboard what we need to do, get the IRS and government out of picking winners and losers, and let the free enterprise system work. So that's my quick thing. Electricity policy, the full portfolio, energy innovation, uh, restore America's financial integrity. In closing, and I want to take your questions because I'm making a lot of quick assertions. In closing, the mission here could be described as provide for the public and the families we serve. I typically try to describe that in kind of what's and how's, right? The what's are make, move, sell, and all that stuff. But I want you to know the hows, your behaviors, your expectation of culture is the most powerful thing you can do. What's get you in the tent? The hows are potentially more powerful and longer lasting. And when I translate the hows at the end of the day to what we do, it is to assure that the communities are better off because we're there, to assure that we're bigger than our bottom line, to assure that we are good citizens however we engage. And that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you very much. So, a couple of questions. Come on now. Yes. Questions, questions. Yes, sir. What do I think about oil price? It's exceedingly cheap. Uh, I got no idea where it's going to go. However, in the world of abundance now, I think through technology revolution, I think we could see a period of prolonged time where energy inputs are cheap. Think about the blessings of America. We're the Saudi Arabia of coal, something like 27%, 28% of the world's coal reserves, and about half of our reserves, a much higher proportion you find elsewhere in the world, are darn good reserves. Let's figure out a way to use that responsibly to oil. Because we're breaking through on technology, fracking, natural gas, we have a huge advantage, not only abundance, but price. Good stuff. I'm a huge proponent of unlimited exporting ability. Third largest consumer of natural gas in the United States, Southern Company is, I want unfettered exports of it. it sounds a little crazy, but I think that floats all boats. Next question. Yes, ma'am. So, um, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's all right. I'll repeat your, yeah, whatever. Piece of cake. Um, and <laughs> especially, frankly, in, um, when we have an electorate that doesn't pay attention to like down ballot primaries and um, areas where they really could make huge difference in the makeup of Congress and the way we share ideas on policy. Um, and I, I'm just obviously a business bull because I was done with that to make sure that better impacts were made trying to cross them off. So you're going to have Joe Kernan later, right? Is that true? Is Kernan going to be later? I mean, he's kind of a friend of mine. I, I guest host Squawk Box. You know, of course, he's the, the guy there. He makes fun of me for this. But here's what I fervently believe. That as leaders of the enterprise, you cannot afford to be cynical. You must be optimistic. You must have a positive slant to what you're trying to do. In terms of breaking the logjam in Congress, uh, one of the things I'm always committed to do, and in fact, I do this with stakeho environmental stakeholder groups and everything else, and it's funny, I'll get the Sierra Club and the NRDC and the Environmental Defense and Union of Concerned Scientists, and anybody that wants to come in the room, I get them in a room and we talk through the issues. Without making the attempt to connect in a human way, the hows, you tend to get demonized, and you tend to get put off here. So what we've got to do is engage in a very direct human way. And what I always say to these folks is, you know what? It's not that we're going to agree on everything, but the most respectful thing you can do as a leader is listen and look for points of intersection. And I swear to you that there are points of intersection in Congress right now where I think we can get bilateral support, bipartisan support. Think about where we were on Simpson Bowles. Think about uh, camp and Bacchus. I think tax reform is something, and I think energy is something. And what we've got to do is relentlessly exhibit the vision 
and courage, the vision to describe a future that is better for America, and the courage to not be dogmatic, to say, this is a way to get it done, and this is how it's going to be better for everybody. Vision and courage, we can do that. Engaging personally, we can do that. I guarantee it. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here.